Well, it is certainly good to be back and everything kind of comes full circle. I did start here in, uh, in 2000, worked here for about four years, uh, thereabouts. And I want to share a quick story, I guess, and, and Mike will not remember this, but uh, somewhere along the lines in about 2002, 2003, like a lot of young insurance agents, I was struggling. I wasn't doing so well. I was probably more worried about what was happening on it at midnight you know, checking things out than I was at 8 a.m. in the morning. Uh, and, and Mike, whether this was either a kick in the pants or an arm around the back, kind of came to me and said, hey, Brent, he goes, sit down for a second. got to tell you something. I said, okay. I'm a little worried. I'm thinking, where is this going to go? <laughs> and he said, this is a really tough business, really tough business. He goes, but if you stick with it, if you really believe in what you're doing, if you stick with it, and you start to accumulate some gray hairs, you're going to make it. And I'm, so, I'm, I'm really excited to say that A, I'm still here, and B, I've added a lot of salt to the pepper. <laughs> a lot of salt to the pepper, so I'm, I'm doing well with the, uh, with the gray hairs. So a little background on me and my, and my story and, and why I'm here and what I'm doing today is I've been able to use digital marketing in a lot of ways to enhance my visibility and my credibility. And so when I came back, after I left ANSA in 2004, uh, I started with the firm now Clemens Insurance in Bloomington, Illinois, home of State Farm Insurance. So there's some competition down there. Um, but started there and, and, and used a lot of the tools that I learned from ANSA, from a lot of the sales trainings I was at, a lot of the different uh, mentors that I had. There were some great people here that helped me along the way. And so I understood that I needed to get out and I needed to network. And I need to go out and, and become a leader in the industry. I need to come out and become the leader in the community and find ways to interact and find the right centers of influence and do all those kind of things. And that worked well. And I started making more sales. And I understand that it was, it was just as important to build myself as it was to build my business. And it, it helped me a long way on this journey. But somewhere in about 2008, 2009, the world of the internet became a little more popular. And obviously the internet's been around for a long time, but the, the ability to use things in social media you know, obviously everyone's familiar with Facebook and Twitter, but also things like blogs. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to separate myself from the competition. Because, let's face it, most insurance agents, they look the same, they talk the same, they walk the same, they use the same type of lingo. So how could I differentiate myself from the competition? And so I had a conversation with a lady and it was somewhere about 2009, 2010. And this lady was a very creative lady, super nice lady. And she said, you know, Brent, she goes, really what you need to do is you need to start a blog. And I, I honestly didn't even really know what that was. And, and I'm like, a blog? She goes, oh, it's living, it's breathing, it, it's got all these things. People will engage with you and you can grow your community. And I'm thinking, okay, lady, you're nuts. You're nuts. What, what do you mean a blog? Why would I want to do that? Oh, you can do all this and you can share. And, okay. So somewhere around 2010, 2011, I said, all right, I'm going to. I'm going to jump in. I'm going to do this blog thing. So I started my blog. It was brendamkelly.com. It was branded for myself, but within the agents, uh, with Clemens Insurance. So it was kind of a co-branded type of deal that I did. And I started just talking. I just started answering questions. I started to engage audience that I wanted, the prospects and customers that I wanted to meet, or the customers that I had that I wanted to provide value for. I just communicated with them. And I can tell you, the first couple of months, Here's what happened. I sat there and I'm like, okay, what am I going to talk about? Why am I doing this? What? Okay, I, I, I said I'm going to do this. I'm going to type, do, 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 and then send. It was probably terrible. And, and I sent it and it was crickets. I, I look at it and I'm like, wow, I got seven views today. That was, that's a great day. Seven views. Wow. This is really working well. But I told myself I was going to be committed to the full year. I said, I'm going to give this a year. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to do two months and bow out. I'm going to continue this process and see where it takes me. So I did. And suddenly, about month three, month four, month five, especially about month six, I started to see some traffic increases just by utilizing a personal branded blog and answering questions that my customers were asking me daily in, in person. I mean, customers ask questions every day to you. How do you solve this? What's the problem with this? Why is it so much? You know, what is replacement cost? Why is work comp so high? So I was, I'll just write about it, right? So that's what I did. And suddenly I had prospects and customers who just said, we really appreciate the value you're bringing to me. That means a lot to me. So I thought, well, this is, this is pretty cool. So I started doing that. And what happened, not only was I gaining credibility with prospects and customers, but I also started to build a reputation within the insurance community. And I was able to publish some articles in national publications. And in 2012, out of nowhere, I was named as top 12 young agent of the year by Agent Broker Magazine. And I can tell you what, there's people in this room that have way bigger books of business than I ever will have. Hugely successful, right? 
And, and there's people that are just starting, just like I did back in that time. But the point is, whether you're just beginning or you have this huge book of business, is how can you utilize digital marketing just to be one piece of the puzzle? It doesn't have to be everything, right? It doesn't have to be your entire marketing strategy. Some people think that once you go from traditional marketing to digital marketing, that suddenly you just stop talking to human beings. And I think some of that comes across the point that we have children. How many have children that can't talk to you face to face? They only send you a text, right? I mean, and I heard this story uh, a while back. I thought it was kind of funny. Actually, it was, I was actually at a CRM class. And uh, a gentleman was talking about a conversation he had with his son. And, uh, and he was saying his son was in college. And, and basically, he, I, I forgot the situation. He was calling him for some. It was a money issue. And so he called his son and said, you know, hey, this is dad. And he need to talk to you about something. Give me a call back. And he said, not but three seconds later, Boop! what's up? Okay, so he said, I got my flip phone back out and I called again. <laughs> now, son, this is dad. Again, I need to talk to you about something. Four seconds later, boop, what about? So now he's starting to get frustrated, right? And so finally, he smartly he goes, so I take my flip phone out. And he goes, I got the phone that you got to hit the button three times to get A, B, C, you know, D, E, F. <laughs> so he's hitting the button and he's doing all this. And, 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 and finally, he sends on his message. He says, it's about your inheritance. He said, now, but two seconds later, whee! He gets the phone call. So the point of it is that people communicate differently, and the consumers communicate differently than they do not just 10 years ago, five years ago, two years ago. It's changed. And the landscape of marketing and your ability of personal brand has changed. Where, think about your own purchasing. Do you like to be interrupted, right? If you watch a TV show, how many watch commercials on TV today? Or do you flip through them, right? How many listen to music on the radio? And the minute the ad comes on, you turn the station, right? Uh, it, it happens all the time. I mean, obviously, the most obvious interruption marketing technique is cold calling. It's been around for decades, more than decades. Does it still work? Yeah, if you do enough of it. Do customers really like it? I don't think so. Not really. So is there a better way? So I think we're shifting, and we already have, from a traditional marketing standpoint to what a lot of people call content marketing where you provide information. You become the information leader in your industry, provides the information, provides the advice where people are searching for you. And once you have that interaction, you suddenly become the expert. So what I'm going to talk about today, skipping through here a little bit, um, is about your personal brand. And how does building your personal brand, I mean, what does that look like? And why do you need to do that? Well, here's the, here's the reality, is that most people, most salespeople, and I've been included in this, we sell what? We sell our company, we sell the agency, which by the way, you have a fantastic agency that does a terrific job in branding. We sell our partner companies. I see some selective folks up there. We sell our companies and we sell their products and services. But we often forget to sell is ourself. We, we, it's like, look, we got this great product from Selective and we're this reputable agency from ANSE. And the consumer says, well, what about you? What do you bring to the table? So we're gonna to talk today about how you can build your personal brand so you can stand out. Everyone looks, I said, everyone looks, walks, talks just alike. So how can you, as the, you know, as the insurance, as the smart insurance agent, stand out? How many points do I want to bring up for you? Um, well, I can figure out the slide thing here. Um, this, is, this is a two quotes from, or one quote from Jeffrey Gittimer. And if you look on the very first slide, in December, I spent four days with Jeffrey Gittimer. Have any of you guys read any of his books? Well, I read the book of Selling, Gold Book of Attitude. I love, I'm a huge Gittimer fan. And if you meet him in person and spend time with him, he is just the same in person as he is in his books. He's, he's straightforward. He says it like he, whether you like him or not, he'll tell you what he thinks. He doesn't back down. And this is a man who's 68 years old. Doesn't seem like he's 68 years old, but he's 68 years old. And we got talking one day at lunch, and he just said, you know, Brent, listen, he goes, the, the days of, 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 you know, of just saying, I'm just going to rest on my laurels, they're over. Because people want me, and I'm 68, I have no reason, I've got, I've got plenty of money, I've got a huge personal brand, but if I don't take this on, if I don't become my own man, if I don't help people, salespeople become their own man, then what's going to happen is consumers are going to lose trust in them. They're going to lose credibility in what they're doing. So let me, let me propose a scenario for all of you and just see if you can put yourself in this situation. Imagine, let's say Friday, you have a call with an important problem. Let's just pretend they're a restaurant owner. Let's say they have three locations, okay? 
So it's a pretty good size account. We're looking forward to this presentation. So it's an initial meeting. So as a good salesperson would do, you do your pre-call. You find out everything you can about them. You do your homework. You understand the locations, the menu, and any problems they've had in the past. And anything you can dig up, right? So you can ask really good, engaging questions, right? Because you want to be you want to be sharp when you walk in there. Now here's where the story changes in today's world. There's a very good chance, a very good chance that that same person, that same business owner, is Googling you. <coughs> He's going, what does Brent do, right? What is he about? Now maybe he comes across something with the agency, great, again, you guys have a great agency website, that's gonna help you, you got an agency blog, that's great. But what about you? Now, let's say you have a competitor that's also coming in later that day or the next day, and he does the same thing to that competitor. And this competitor's good. He gets the digital world, he's smart. So not only is he located on digital media, on the internet, and is he Googleable? By the way, is Googleable a word? Is that a verb? Googling, Googleable? I don't know how that works out. But he's Googling this person. And what does he find? He finds a personal blog. He gets to know about him and his family. He gets to know what values he represents. Oh, by the way, this guy, he specializes in restaurant insurance, and he writes about foodborne illnesses. He writes about work comps, work trips, and balls. He writes about anything that has to do with restaurants. And he doesn't write about restaurants for him, he writes about restaurants for his reader. So this restaurant is going, wow, this is great information. This is really good. So who do you think has the advantage when they both walk in there? All right, it's a pretty obvious answer. The guy who's built the reputation online ahead of time. And again, I'm not taking anything away from the, off, you know, the offline. I love offline marketing and networking and getting to know people and referrals. That's all important. But how can you add this piece to the puzzle, to your repertoire? This is my business card today. That's it. Now, there's something in the back, so I shouldn't say that's it. That's not really fair. Um, so that's my business card. And the question I ask all of you is, would you be comfortable using that business card? Maybe you would. Maybe you won't. But I can tell you, your consumers are doing that. What do you do when you make a purchase today? When you think about making a purchase, are you trying to learn anything at all possible about the product that you're looking at? You go to Mother Google, because Google has all the answers. I think I, I probably learned more from Google in the last few years than I did in my entire public education system, probably. It's got a lot of stuff on it. So just to put this in scope, so you can have an idea about this, is this is currently the world population including social media platforms. I find this kind of fascinating. And people are asking, what does it have to do with me? Well, we'll talk about it. But you take the top 10 populations and you include the social media applications out there, and six of them are not countries, but they're social media platforms. So what does that say? Well, it says that too many people spend time talking about cats on Facebook, probably, right? But the reality of it is that that's where people are at. That's where they're going. That's where they're getting the information. So again, are you going to play the game? Are you going to be there? Uh, what I find really fascinating is some people, this is what I did. I said, what's Tencent? Anybody know what Tencent is? Anybody? I'm curious. But I didn't know. It's a, it's a marketing platform in China. It's a social media in China. So China's own social media platform, it's just within China, is bigger than our own country. That's pretty cool. Although I just learned earlier that China's not going to do so well. So. <laughs> Uh, here's an infographic I want to show you too. This may be kind of hard to read, so I'll, I'll just hit some of the highlights of this. Now I got this actually from a, a company called Agency Online that I do some work with. And the stats are actually pretty interesting. 97% of consumers search for local business online. 97%. Uh, I'm not a math major, that's pretty close to 100. All right. Uh, one thing I want to point out too, 52% of consumers say blogs have impacted their purchase decisions. So, so half the people said that a blog has impacted their purchasing decision. So I ask you, master salesperson, would it help you in your sales if half the people that you were working with knew you had a presence that provided them value? And my answer is yes. And my goal today isn't to, I can't convert anybody, I can't convince you to do anything. This is up to you if you want to play the game or not. I just want to give you information, and most importantly, I want you to think. Just think about it. You know, most people say, I'm not going to do it. And this is the reality. Most people hide from it, like this gentleman right here. He's, he's running with his briefcase. And as I talk to insurance agents, as I talk to agency owners, I talk to a lot of different people in the industry, 
I've come across many, many reasons why insurance agents fear and avoid digital marketing. And I could probably give you a list that's probably you know, 100, 200 deep. But I'm gonna focus on 10 things today. 10 things that people generally give me as, as I would call excuses. Or, I can't do it because of this, or I don't have the time for this, or whatever it may be, we'll go through those. So let's talk about why insurance agencies fear digital marketing. This is my buddy here. Um, and this may, it's a, I talk to people that say like this, I'm not, I'm a little bit better than a paper on the computer. Well, there you go, this is the guy. But a lot of people tell me they just don't understand technology. Say, Brett, you know, that's great. That's, but that's for the young people. That's for the young people. That's where they're at. If you're under 40, great. You can do it. It's good for you, Brent, because you're 36. You can do this stuff. I'm 48, or I'm 57, or I'm whatever the age. I can't do it. Well, first thing is, is that you, again, are, are very forced to be part of an agency. And I've talked to both Stephanie and Rachel. They want you to utilize this, and they want to help you. They want to help you do this. They want to help you succeed. So it doesn't have to be all on your own. You have a team here to help you. But here's the thing about technology. You can love it, you can hate it, you can fear it, you can avoid it. But here's what you can't do. You can't ignore it because it's everywhere. So there isn't a, you don't have a choice to say, well, I'm just gonna go sit over here in the corner and uh, I hope, uh, hope it's okay and let time just tick on by. Because it's not. And, and to show you, to give you an idea of that, I'm gonna show you a clip from 1994. Now, this clip, so it's 20 years old. Right? So I'm thinking, 20 years old. This was, again, not too long before when I started my career in ANSET. And these are supposedly, well, they are, they're, they're smart people, but some of the smartest people out there. And they have a conversation about the internet in 1994. And what they say is, is actually quite humorous. And when we get done, I'll, I'll, I'll give some uh, takeaways, my takeaways from that. So here's 1994. Back in 56 pass, I wasn't prepared to translate that. This was to have a little tease. I had a little mark with the A and then the ring around it. Hats? See, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. um, Case that she thought it was about. Yeah. Oh. But I've never heard it. I've never heard it said. I don't I said it. mark, but never heard it said. And then it sounded stupid when I said it. Violet's added in DC. So whether you're brand new and you thought, okay, maybe I'm going to try this Twitter thing or this Facebook thing or whatever specifically what platform you want to use, you don't have to have all the answers. And hopefully they've come a long way since then. I'm thinking they have. But two is the fact that again, this is 1994. That's only 20 years ago. That isn't that long ago. So as as agents, we need to start thinking about not just what's in 2014, but as earlier we talked about thinking about the future, is what's going to happen in 2019. Right? What's going to, what, how consumers are going to buy in 2024? How about 2029? How about 2034? Some of you, I'm going to be dead or retired. Okay, fine. That's fine. But you have to think about if you plan on being in this, in this business for longer than, I would say, five years, you better start acknowledging this stuff because it's changing at a rapid pace. And the way that you want to do business may not be the way the consumer wants to do business. And by the way, when I say consumer, they're also business owners. So just be like, oh, I'm a B&B guy. 
Okay. Does that B2B guy, does he have a family? Yep. Does he buy a Loretta River product? Yep. Does he search online? Yep. So it doesn't necessarily matter if it's B2B, B2C, and we'll talk about some of that later too, about where I think, where I think uh, technology is going. Something I, another excuse that I hear often is, I have no clue where to begin. Look like this guy. Greg, does that look like your office? Where are you sitting, Greg? Like, <laughs> some days. Some days. Okay. All right. So that looks like Greg's office. Um, I was kidding him earlier. I said, I remember it used to be up on the top of there. I used to go up there. It was like this. I said, I, said, I think it, you were like God. You had all these cords and wires, and you had access to all the information. If you need anything, you had to go to Greg. You had all, <laughs> all the stuff. It was really cool. Like, hey, is it still like that? Yeah. yeah. So I got there, and it's like, this servers are humming, he's got cords, you're slipping over, and oh, Greg, where are you at? And I'm just fine, oh, here I am, he's like, ah, it's kind of like the Wizard of Oz, you know? So, anyway, sorry about that, that's kind of too I like it. Um, but there's no clue where to begin. A lot of it is, that even if I'm, I'm able to embrace technology, what am I going to post about? What am I going to write about? What am I going to do? Like, where do I start, right? Like, where do I start? You don't have to make this that complicated. Here's a really easy solution if you go, okay, I want to get involved in the, in the digital world. What can I do? Here's a really easy thing you can do. Go find your 25 best customers. 25 best customers. Hopefully you have 25 customers. If you don't, then whatever you have, all right? And go ask them and say, listen, I want to continue to provide you value. You're important to me. And I want to also provide value to other prospects and customers. So I'm ready to join this digital revolution and get online. What kind of things could I write about, post about that would be a value to you? What, what would help you? And just sit back and listen. Because here's what I see often, is I see agents that just say, hey, you know what, I think I'm gonna open my Twitter account this morning. And the first thing they do is they go back to interruption marketing. First post, hey, got a great EPL product, call me. Nobody cares, nobody cares. But your customers will tell you what they care about. And so that's what you need to focus on. Ask your customers. They will, they will lead you to where you need to go. And they, in fact, I'm going to give you a quick story uh, of a person that I respect a lot in the industry. He's a younger guy. Uh, he started as an agent in his, his mid 20s, and you know, maybe an advantage in the digital world uh, from what he was going to do. But he came up with an idea a couple years ago. And he said, Here's what I'm going to do I'm going to pull through social media and in person and email, whatever communication I can do. And I'm going to ask everybody, I'm going to get the top 100 questions that people ask this agency. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to answer every one of them every day. I'm going to post it on YouTube. 30 seconds, a minute, however long it takes. And that's what he did. He called 100 questions in 100 days. Now, what did this do? Well, first of all, it gave him huge credibility because he's answering questions that people actually have asked and putting them back out there. He's putting it on YouTube. He's sending it share to Facebook. He's putting it on Twitter. He's all over the map. Secondly, when people search a question like, what is non-owned auto. Guess who pops up? This guy with his video. It's genius. And it wasn't that difficult. But I think sometimes as agents we try to make, we make this so much harder than it has to be. So don't focus on it like, you don't have to be the world's best writer, come up with these great posts. Just listen to your customers and answer their questions. And if you do that, you're gonna be, you're gonna be just fine. All right, another question I often get is this puzzle of social media. Which I would argue that social media is, is that phrase is going to pretty much just go away. It's going to turn into just marketing. It's just going to turn into media. It's just going to turn into the internet. Uh, that catchphrase is kind of losing steam a little bit because everybody knows about it. It's almost part of entire marketing. And the question I often get is, okay, what platform should I even go to? You know, there's all these different choices. I'm confused. I'm busy. I got enough clients on my plate. Why would I want to do this? Where should I go? Well, here's a here's a very generic answer is going to help any of you guys, is that it just depends. It just depends. Because, you know, Facebook, some would argue that it's better for a business to consumer because of a lot more personal relationships and story. And some people say, use Instagram, it's great, great photos. And some people say, use Google Plus because it's got great content and you're searchable on Google Plus. And some would say, use Twitter because it's such fast interaction and communication. A lot of people say, use LinkedIn. It's B2B, that's where everybody's at. Um, there isn't a really clear answer. I'm not here to give you a lot of the technical how and the what, because I can't do that in 60 minutes. But what I want to get you thinking about is just an overall picture of how to communicate with your customers. So what I, what I want you to think is not so much B2B and not so much B2C, but P2P, person to person. 
That's marketing today. It's person to person. It doesn't matter where they're at, what they're doing. It's how are you communicating? And most importantly, what value are you giving them? See, people don't want products and services. They want outcomes. That's what they want, right? They don't, they don't care that you sell a traveler's product or a selective product. I'm sorry. It's true, right? Because people buy from people. And it goes back to what I said earlier is that so much we try to sell a company, we try to sell an agency, which are both great, and you need those platforms. You need to have good company partners, and you do, and you need to have a strong agency presence. But at the end of the day, guess who writes the check and shakes your hand? That person. It's P to P. So whether you're using any of these things, it doesn't matter. What I will say is this, is that I think you need to focus on, if I had to give anybody advice on specifically where to start, because I do believe in the power of having a home base and having your own blog. Now again, from what I've been told, the agency here will help you with that, and you also have opportunities, correct me if I'm wrong, is they're asking you as agents to put your content on the agency blog to get noticed. And from what I've heard, that's been a stretch. It's been a little difficult. And I understand that. It's difficult because when I showed you earlier when I put the Google Me card on there, it doesn't happen in three months. It doesn't happen in four months. That takes time. It's like any relationship you have offline, it's just like that online. It doesn't just happen. You don't snap your fingers and say, hey, I wrote three posts this week. I'm number one on Google. No, you gotta earn that. So you gotta be creative, you gotta think, and you gotta figure out how you're gonna connect P to P. So don't worry so much B to B, B to C, all that kind of stuff. And you know what a lot of people ask me too, I'm gonna kind of go on a tangent here, a little soapbox. People ask, the big question I get is, what's the ROI, right? What's the ROI? I mean, it's a fair question. Why should I spend time on stuff if I'm not making money, right? My answer is, what's the ROI when you have a cup of coffee with an important prospect? Do you track that? What's the ROI when you share a valuable tip of information to a customer? What's the ROI when you get to a networking event and make two really good connections? It's hard to pinpoint. So you need to think of social media and digital marketing not so much as a sales tool, although it can be, but as a communication and engagement tool. It's just another branch that you can help leverage your brand and get to know people at different levels, and they get to know you as a real human being, not an insurance robot. It's kind of important. All right. Next thing, what do I communicate? So I'm talking about some different things, but again, back to what I said most agents do, they stand on top of the rooftop and they say, hey, I'm on digital media. Come buy some stuff from me, I'm here, I'm waiting. Business is open. And that's not, again, not what consumers want. They do not want to be shouted to. They do not want to be shouted at. They want to be given value. So here I'm gonna give you guys four ways whether you have a blog, whether you decide to post on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever social platform you want to do. I'm going to give you four ideas of how you can use your own personal strength to help leverage your personal brand. Number one, this is the easiest because it's what most of you do every single day, is become an educator. Right? You educate every day anyway. You're talking to prospects and clients and you're saying, how can I help you? And you're sitting in the back and you're listening. You're taking the feedback and you're providing information and advice that they can use to benefit. The exact same thing you would do online. So if you have a blog, like I mentioned, 100 questions in 100 days, that was education. They were just giving education is all that was. So that's the easiest, because most agents feel comfortable there. Number two is a, is a connector. There's a good chance that, I'll, I'll ask this question before. How many of you know somebody that you just say, man, that person knows everybody? Don't you know somebody like that? It just seems like they're connected everywhere they go. It's like, how do they know everybody? Well, the cool thing is I'm guessing that there's some of you in this room, probably a lot of you in this room, in the business that you're in, that are actually that person. You are a connector. You know the banker, and you know the mortgage guy, and you know the business down the street, and you know the manufacturer guy, and your son plays baseball with this guy, and you go to church with this lady, and you know all these kind of things. So you're connected. So the way that you can do it on social media is just connect people. Hey, I see that my client's having a sale. I'm gonna talk about it. I'm gonna help promote them. I'm gonna connect this person to that person. And these are things that can totally change the dynamic because what you're doing to your clients and your potential prospects, or actually clients are looking at you and going to say, hey, thank you. Thanks for connecting me to this person. This really helped me. Prospects go, why isn't my guy connecting me? Why is this guy connecting me, but my guy's not connecting me? They should talk to him. So being a connector is another way that you can do that. Number three is a storyteller. Now this gets a little bit maybe a little bit goofy to some degree, but everybody loves a story. And if you're an insurance agent, it's often difficult to let your creative side ooze out. 
right? Because you're just used to being facts, figures, data. But if you can tell a good story, you can sell some insurance. I promise you that. So think about when you were a kid and the great stories you had, they captivate you, they engage you. So think about situations, maybe in a business life, maybe somewhere that can help a client, where you can tie that into a story and talk about it. Because people want to know, they love stories. If you shot at them like this guy, it's not gonna work. And finally, I almost say most importantly, is you can use humor online. It's okay. Now I don't mean telling you know, jokes or offending anybody or anything that's you know, a little bit off topic, but people buy from people they like, right? And humor, I'm gonna leave you my, my one big quote here. Humor leads to listening. If I can make you laugh at me, you will listen to me. It's a fact. Humor leads to listening. So if you can use the, the channel, channel of digital media, the online world, and have a little fun once in a while, tell a good story, be a connector, be an educator, you're gonna have something to say. You're gonna have something to communicate about. All right, another thing that I hear is uh, a lot of people is that digital marketing just doesn't apply to the insurance business. Right, you just, I, I, I'll back up and tell you a story. So I was, uh, I, I think it was an insurance journal. Uh, I, was, I contributed to an article about two years ago uh, about the online presence and selling, you know, being able to be visible on the digital world. And the comments that were on the article were fascinating. Uh, because there was, and again, it's not a right or wrong, but there was a number of comments that were basically saying this, you know, kind of putting glasses up. Listen, Sonny, you don't understand how real business is done. Real business is done with a handshake. That's the insurance business. Which I would counter, amen, yes it is. I love doing business face to face with a handshake. That's the way, if I could do anything, I would do business face to face with a handshake all the time. But the question is, why leave, why leave it at that? So if I have a great meeting, Jonathan, we had a great meeting, okay? We hit it off really well, we're interacting, good engagement, like, oh, great, great meeting. And then I don't see Jonathan again for two weeks, we're kind of stagnant. I mean, I can send an email, I can make a phone call, but what if I involve in his social media sphere and he gets to know more about me and I'm providing continual value I write a blog post that, that hits, hits a nerve. That's really good. So I'm available 24-7, 365, all the time, that Jonathan can check out what I have to say and think. And that's important. So as much as I love a handshake, as much as I love face-to-face -face interaction, if you're not doing the digital thing, you're probably leaving a little bit, you're, you're missing a little bit. You're just missing a little bit. So um, let's talk about this too. I mean, clients, think about your best clients. I am guessing that your best clients are generally also probably pretty good friends. And if they're not now, they're probably gonna become good friends. And we all have problem clients, and we all have our favorite clients. The problem clients generally are buddies we play golf with. Our favorite clients are. So it's the same thing with social media. If you can utilize that, you can have tremendous success into that. And another thing that people have uh, questioned me on is they say, hey Brent, this whole blogging thing you're talking about, first of all, I don't totally get it. And secondly, who in the heck reads a blog? Well, these numbers here, I don't know if they are impressive or not impressive. I, I, really, I don't really care. Um, but this is, this is my blog stats for the last, it's actually not even two years because I switched platforms. And so, again, I don't talk about that much of exciting stuff. I have a pretty limited base, so it, you know, it, it is what it is. But not even two years, I'm actually, I looked today, I'm over 90,000 about a month ago. So I've had 90,000 eyeballs read my stuff. Now again, maybe they're there for two seconds, Maybe they're there for two minutes. Google, Google Analytics can kind of tell you that. But the point of it is I've had 90,000 eyeballs. This is by far, I wrote this about two and a half years ago. What in the heck is an experience modification rate? Not very exciting. 6,000 people have read that article. I mean, and it just shocks me, why? Why, because people search for that. They want to know, you know what they ask at their desk? They don't have a good agent helping them? What is an experience modification rate? Boom! I've had, I'll tell you this, you're gonna ask, what does that meant for your business? Well, I can tell you, when I started this, I wasn't very smart, because I didn't do a very good job of, of, of dealing with my geography, my geography very well. But I had, I've had several calls from contractors in Florida, Louisiana, Texas. Hey, Brent, can you help with my work out? No. <laughs> I can't, I can't. But do you have any friends in Illinois? Because I'd love to help you. But I did get some other calls from people in Illinois, and it's built credibility. And you know what else it does? Here's a cool thing about blogging. 
And I've used this for a niche that I use, I'll probably talk about this later, but I, I, I did a lot of writing in cyber liability. <laughs> is that you're meeting with somebody, you're having a conversation, and they ask some questions, and at the end you go, hey, you know, if you want more information, go to this link right here. I wrote a whole article about what this is about, it might help you. I mean, it sounds crazy, but in their mind, you are published. That's credibility. It's credibility, they love that stuff. They're like, and I, I will go ahead and tell the story. On cyber liability, I had an issue. This one, cyber liability is so new that there's not a lot of other agents talking about it. I mean, there, there are now, but even a year and a half ago, there really wasn't. Um, but I did a series of probably 15 to 20 posts on cyber liability. I wrote all about it. And I had a situation where I was meeting with a law office. I had about 80 employees, and I sat down with them, and they said, tell me about this data breach thing, the cyber liability. And we had a good conversation about it. And by the end, I said, hey, you know what you can do is you can go, and I've written several articles about this, just click, and I actually had a tag, so I had to this. We had all my articles sitting there, and he read them. Next day, he called and said, when did we get this thing started? Right now, I don't know. He might have bought it anyway. I have no idea. But I can tell you, it didn't hurt my, my reputation at all. And if I had competition that didn't do that, I guarantee they're going to buy from me and not from him. So it's just something to keep in mind uh, when you're doing this. All right, this is my favorite little picture, sir. Because I had this guy call me. Um, have you ever had this guy call you during the day? Uh, I have. It's never a good thing. Um, but anyway, one of the, one of the uh, issues I run into or people tell me about is that, okay, that makes sense, but if I build my online presence, if I grow my visibility on the online space, what's going to happen is this guy is not just going to call me and scream, and he's not just going to tell Joanne, and Joanne's not going to tell Tim, and Tim's not going to tell Manny, but what's going to happen is, is that he's going to post something online. He's going to go to my Facebook page. He's going to go to my Twitter handle. He's going to go to wherever I'm at. And he's going to say some really nasty things about me. And I don't really want to open myself up to that can of worms. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have some seriously bad news for you. Really bad news. See this guy? He's going to talk about you whether you're there or not. He doesn't care whether you have a Facebook page, a Twitter handle. He just knows that he's mad. And he's going to tell people about it. So you have two choices. You can either be there to defend yourself, or better yet, maybe there's a problem you didn't even know about. How many times have you seen that? Where someone's got an issue, and they get angry, and they go online and vent? I can tell you who does a really good job of this. This is a company deal, but um, uh, U.S. Cellular for a long time. Now you can say what you want about U.S. Cellular, but I was following their Twitter handle. They do a very good job. People come on, they complain about cell phones, right? Your service sucks. I lost my call. You know, you told me I'd get a free phone. I didn't. Well, right. And you would go on and say, listen, Brent, we're really sorry about that. How can we help you? Now, again, can they answer every question? Maybe not. But here's what happens online that's magical. As you build your reputation, if somebody says something negative about you, if you have enough fans, right, if you have enough people that believe in what you're already doing, they're going to come to your church for you. They don't need to do anything. You have one guy that says, Brent's an idiot. He told me he sold me a bad policy. I don't like it. And they got mad at people say, that's not what I experienced. Brent's a great guy. Taking care of me for seven years. Love him. It's the same thing holds true for Amazon. Think about how you buy things, right? How many of you, when you how, first of all, how many of you buy on Amazon? Be honest. Almost everybody. Amazing. How many of you, I have a question for you. How many of you read the description of the item first or the reviews? Reviews, right? That's where we are. That's, you're the consumer. I'm telling you exactly what consumers do. Same thing. So the question is, is if you, if I go to your page, if you're online, or I'll say you're not online, right, and something's <laughs> negative about you, and there's nobody there to defend you, what am I going to think? I don't, I don't care that Amazon, if I see a product, and it's got 95 star reviews, and it's got four four star reviews, and two three star reviews, and four one star reviews, well, first of all, let's be honest, what do we all do? We read the one star reviews, right? Why? And usually what you find out is, A, the one-star people that comment are idiots. It's true. <laughs> they are. They're idiots. They're like, no, 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 no. Okay. And secondly, you're going, well, if there was 100 five-star reviews, I might have a problem because some might be rigged. Nobody gets 100 five-star reviews, right? There's always somebody that has to. People are okay if you're not perfect. You just got to be there. You got to have enough, you gotta have enough fans to offset those few people that might be like this guy. All right, how many of you heard of a guy named David Carroll? David Carroll, do you know, you know what I'm talking about? He is a musician, I'll give you a hint. And then, uh, what if I add this, David Carroll, musician, United Airlines. 
Because I know I'm known as a guitar. There you go. The guitar guy, right? So the story of David Carroll is simple. David Carroll is a musician. He was flying with his band. Uh, on this trip, he told the United, the, the super nice people at United, they're always there for customer service, fly the friendly skies. He said, listen, I've got a $3,000 guitar. Here's the case. What do I need to do to help protect this? Oh, you're fine. Let me take care of everything. Fine. Okay. So he gets on, he's in a plane, he's in a tarmac, and suddenly he sees the luggage people. <laughs> The plane catch, and he sees his guitar. He knows it's a guitar. He sees it. And he's like, "That's my guitar." This is getting thrown around. Well, needless to say, he lands. What happens? The guitar breaks. So David Carroll is one of those people that would be considered a smart consumer, and beyond that, he's creative. So what he said was, "I have the power of social media. I have the power of the online world." So I'm going to talk about it on Facebook, Twitter. Oh, by the way, I'm a musician. So if I'm really smart, I'm going to write a little song about this. And when I get done, I'm going, to tell you, I'm, going to, I'm going to ask you if you have any guess to how many views this has got. This is a five minute break for me because my voice is tired. So enjoy this music. <laughs> it's pretty fun. I flew United Airlines on my way to Nebraska. The plane departed Halifax, connecting in Chicago. Personally, they can say whatever they want about you. You're not there to defend yourself. And two, you can use it as a service tool. There's never been a greater power that, that, that agents and agencies can now respond to customers' issues. Because let's face it, a lot of times customers don't even tell you what's wrong. They don't tell their friend what's wrong, but they don't tell you. And you can fix it. 
So if they go on and say something and say, listen, we can fix this problem. Maybe you can't fix other problems, but at least you need to know what's going on. So that's just something I want to point out, kind of a fun, funny video. I thought that was pretty interesting. And it just shows the power of the consumer. I mean, 15 million views, pretty crazy. All right, um, next thing I run into with, with online, people's, uh, I guess, excuses or, or refusal to do some of it, is that you can be very uncomfortable sharing free information online. And this is supposed to be candy, but I think it's actually marshmallows. Um, but one of my very first sales trainers, who I respect highly, and I know he's spoken to ANSA several times because I was there when he had uh, Jeff Jalone, who passed away a few years ago. Uh, Jeff Jalone is a terrific man, terrific sales trainer. You know, he's, he's spoken selective too, right, Eric? Yep, several times. Um, awesome guy. One of the things that we talked about in, my, in, in those sales training was spill your candy in the lobby. You guys heard that phrase, right? Don't spill your candy in the lobby. And I think you know, the whole point of that is obviously if you go out and meet a new prospect, and you know, we get so anxious to solve the problems before we can have the opportunity to get paid, right? So if someone says, you're listening, you're like, oh my gosh, I can have that company, I can do that, I can be the hero, right? And you start diving in and you answer all the questions, and boom, you're like, yes, got it. And what does he do? He goes back and talks to his agent, and he likes more than you, and you're screwed, right? That's what happens. I think in the online world, with digital marketing, that's changed a little bit. And let me explain why. It's because consumers today, they want free stuff whether we like it or not, right? First of all, look at like iPhone apps. No one wants to pay for an iPhone app until what? You get a free trial, right? Everybody wants a free trial, only 30 days, let me check it out. And that's kind of how consumers' minds are today, even in the online world, even in the insurance world to some degree. They want to know more about you and trust you before they're ever going to think about buying from you. So the hard thing I think a lot of insurance we have is how can they go on and answer all these questions and solve these problems online without the opportunity Hey. Well, the reality of it is, I have a point, this is what I've come up with, is I think that consumers today, in 2014 and beyond, they don't need as much information. It used to be that I had all the information. I know everything about business interruption, I know everything about workers' compensation. You need to see me to get that information. I'll tell you about it when we get there. But today, again, with the power of Mother Google, I don't need that information. It's there. I can just search it. I can all about it. People look at the 6,000 people found out what the experience modification rate was. Because I wrote about it. So they don't need you to be the, the guy that explains the experience modification rate. You know what they want? They want advice. How to utilize that information. That's where you come in. So if you can provide that information and say, listen, if I'm sitting there and I'm, I, and I'm talking about experience modification rates, and someone goes, hey, that's really good information. That's really good information, but I appreciate that. How do I utilize that? Well, let me help you. Now I've written an insurance policy. So that's how that process works. And again, I'm not opposed to spilling candy in a lobby, but I think it's changed a little bit uh, from the online world. Drop my clicker. All right. No, no doubt about it that tattoos are pretty permanent. Well, there's some things you can do, I suppose, to get rid of tattoos, but they're permanent. And there is a fear in the online world of permanency, right? Ask, uh, let's see, I, saw, I didn't mention I'm a, I'm a graduate from the University of Illinois, so yes, I am a fib. Um, but I'm a happy fib. I'm a downstate, you know, agriculture fib. I'm not a Chicago fib. They're totally different, totally different. But permanency of the online political platform. So my buddy at University of Illinois, Richard Mendenhall, decided he was going to talk about Osama bin Laden a few years back. Remember that? That was a bad idea. And it was permanent. He can delete it, but it's there. So there's the fear of whatever I post, it's on there. I, I had a guy tell me once, he said, you know what the E in email stands for, right? It's not electronic, it's eternal. That's what the E in email is, eternal. So there's no doubt about it that you have to be really careful in what you post and what you talk about online. But I've had agency managers come to me too and say, listen, I don't really want my guys on the online platform because I'm not really sure I trust them. My response to that is, so you're telling me you trust your agent to go talk to a prospect or a customer about potentially millions of dollars in liability coverage and big financial decisions that you have no idea what the discussion is going on, but you're scared for him to post something on Facebook. And that doesn't make sense to me. Maybe I'm backwards. Now, again, the fear of it is permanent, but I think hopefully if you're good, smart agents, like I know you all are, if you're here to and say you are, is that you realize there's a consequence to what you put on there the fear is real, but the opportunity is greater, right? There's a fear there. But just don't be stupid. I mean, do you say stupid stuff to your prospects and customers when you're with them? I mean, maybe. 
Hope not too much. Some of you are laughing. Like, yeah, I do. But you just got to be careful with that kind of stuff. All right. Two last things here, and I'll wrap up on we'll some questions and answers. Um, some people are unwilling to commit fully to this. And that's why today I've talked more about the why than I have the what and the how. Because you can find out anything on how to do something today. I mean, again, and you've got a great department here back there that can help you do things. But the why, I'm unable to commit fully. Like I told in my story, when I started my blog, three months in, I was getting no views. It didn't make any sense to me. I didn't understand what I was going to do. It's the same thing in networking. You know, people go to networking events and they try to build their reputation and they go, man, I, I, went, to, I went to a business before hours today. I only met one guy. I think I'm going to quit. I mean, it just doesn't work that way in this business. You've got to commit to it. Because if you don't, it's not going to go anywhere. And you're going to get frustrated and you're going to end up just saying that I, I got something better to do. And the problem is you're going to miss the boat on that because there's too many customers out there that, that desire this information. And, and at the end of the day, your job is to serve. Your job is to serve the customer. And now you have an opportunity to serve in a way that's never been available before. I had someone tell me that you live in the greatest time in the history of the earth to be a salesperson. Because every person is now a media company, whether you like it or not. In years past, you had to pay a bazillion dollars for radio ads, right? TV is even more expensive. To get a little blurb in a newspaper costs a, a tremendous amount of money. Now you can do all that for basically nothing. I paid $250 for my blog over the last couple of years to host it and for a theme. I mean, so you can't use money as an excuse either. You just got to commit to it. And that's where most people generally fall a little bit short. All right, final thing is uh, people generally are worried about no one follows me. And we kind of already addressed this kind of thing. But here's what I'll tell you. That if you, if you focus on four things, I'm going to tell you four things. If you believe in four things, if you believe in, the, in, the, in the, the value that you bring as a person, if you believe in the value of this agency and what they represent, if you believe in the value that your companies, your company partners have and that they can give you, and you believe, most importantly, that what you're bringing your service, your expertise, your level of education, anything you can bring to the table is greater than your competitors, so the overall value, then you're going to succeed online just as much as you would offline. But you've got to believe in all four of those. You've got to believe in you, you've got to believe in the agency, you've got to believe in the companies, and you've got to believe in the value that you're bringing. So if you do those four things, you're going to be just fine. Last thing here is I want to talk about, I mentioned that I, I'm partnering with Jeffrey Gittimer, uh, and I can do some of his training products, and, and I love his information. But the story on Jeffrey Gittimer, again, I see he's 68 years old. And he had no real reason at 66 to start being involved in social media and the online space. I mean, he makes plenty of money, believe me. Plenty of money. He's very well known. He's internationally known. He's written 12 books. You know, so why? And so, again, my goal today isn't to convince you to do anything. You've got to make that decision yourself. I just hopefully give you some ideas to inspire you. You go, this might be worth my time. But if you can't take it from me, listen to Jeffrey. This is about five minutes of him talking about should you go for it or not. Are you in the social media world or standing on the sidelines kind of waiting? Dude, social media has changed the world. Business social media has changed the world. Let me clarify that statement. Social media has changed your world. Whatever you're doing online, whether it's tweeting, LinkedIn, Facebooking, or YouTubing, social media has changed your way of communicating one-on-one, -on -one, one on customer base, and one on the world. Facebook is the easiest phenomenon to understand because it's changed the way you communicate with your friends and your family, and has opened the freedom door to anyone that you come in contact with, either business or personal. You found old friends, schoolmates, coworkers, and they have found you. And in the same way, you can find customers and prospective customers, and they can find you. Because of social media and the internet, big companies no longer have a big advantage. Anybody can create a news blog that can immediately compete with the New York Times. The music industry has been leveled by groups performing their own videos and selling them on iTunes. Groups are creating free videos on YouTube, and they've done it far more effectively at far less cost than records or CDs since they've been invented. LinkedIn has created a new way to cold call and much more sophisticated way for businesses and business people to connect. You can go on LinkedIn and search by job title and find prospective customers at no cost. 
but I would recommend that you search by keywords. It's also the employment agency of the future. Twitter allows you to gain a following of people interested in your thoughts, your information, or the information of others that they perceive as valuable. Short, retweetable messages. YouTube is the new movie theater. And you have about one billion choices. Millions of new movies are added every day. If you've ever heard of the expression to the cloud, YouTube currently occupies half of heaven. Somebody interviewing for a job completely exposes themselves through Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube the same way a company is exposed. Most businesses, business people, business executives, and salespeople are still social media inept. Hope that's not you. And note well. There are very few things or actions, and there are very few people or circumstances that can change the rules of the game. Social media has changed all four. People, circumstances, things, and actions have all been changed forever as a result of posting, tweeting, linking, and connecting. And the people that have taken advantage of it have changed their outreach in a way that has all of their traditional competitors shaken in their boots. Think about your social media place as you plan your marketing outreach for the next 10 years and ask yourself these questions. Number one, what's my current position in my marketplace? Number two, how do my customers perceive me? Number three, can my customers access my company to leave comments and tell stories 24 seven? Number four, do I really know what my competition is thinking and saying? Number five, how attractive am I to my customers? And number six, what's my value proposition that favors my customers and how do I let them know it day after day without simply repeating it? There's an unspoken strategy for businesses to employ, and that strategy focuses around the word value. The more you offer, the more attractive you'll become. The less you offer, the more anonymous you'll remain. As of this moment, Facebook is only the third largest country in the world. There's no doubt it will achieve number one status in under a decade. Think about that. Right now, Facebook has a 16% market share of the world population. Now, I've only been actively involved in social media for three years. This year, I'm going all out to attract, engage, and connect with value. I've hired a consulting firm to help me, not manipulate it, just help me. I have three people on the staff posting events, monitoring my accounts, and helping me. But here's a key word. The word is authenticity. I do my own tweets either dictate or post my own updates on Facebook. I'm active, accepting invitations, and responding or corresponding on LinkedIn. I believe that staying personally involved keeps my message true to my philosophy, but also helps me learn. Nike said, just do it. I'm saying, just do it now. All right. So I think there's some, some value there, especially coming. It's, it's one thing for me as a 36-year-old to say, hey, you need to get on this. And people go, well, sure, right? It's, it's, it's your demographic. But when you hear people that are 68 with success saying the same type of thing and it works, it's just something to keep in mind. It's something to keep in mind. And the cool thing is, again, about the social media is that it's your voice. It's your brand. And you have the opportunity to make it whatever you want. It doesn't mean you need to make it different than what you are offline. You should be the same person offline as you are online. But just be you, and people will buy from you. All right? So with that, any questions? i got about 10 minutes or so left. I know you guys are on schedule here. So I'm here to answer anything I can for you. Yeah. How much time do you spend in social media per week? Um, on average, I would say I probably spend about an hour a day uh, on it. And part of it for me depends on 
I do blog posts. So um, blog posts take longer than social media updates, obviously. If I'm writing 500 words on something, it's going to take longer. I can also tell you that when I started doing this and I started writing, it took me twice as long as it does now. I got better at it. Um, but it's up to you. What I would tell anybody in the room is that if you want to get into this and you're going to fully commit to it, commit a reasonable amount of time. You don't need to spend four hours a day doing it. If it's 20 minutes, spend 20 minutes. If it's 30 minutes, spend 30 minutes. But be diligent and say for 30 minutes, I'm either going to learn how to do this better, or now that I've learned it, I'm going to apply it. Right? And take it slowly. You're not going to, you're not going to accomplish it overnight. So to answer your question, I'm about a, probably an hour a day. Uh, on that. And I also do, it depends, sometimes in the evening I'll do some um, replies and things like that that people have commented and make sure I'm, I'm staying in touch with people. So, yeah. Do you let someone else edit your blog before it goes on? <laughs> I probably should. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Um, no. And I can tell you to this day I find typos. Um, and here's the thing about that. I used to get really freaked out about that. Like, how unprofessional can that look? I've never had a person complain. You know why? If they find value in the article, who cares? Right? I'm, not, I'm not a legal professional. Um, that being said, there are people that are very uncomfortable with that. If you know someone who can edit, whether it be your wife, whether it be a kid, and say, hey, could you read this? Well, I can tell you, if you're doing posting online, here's where I get in trouble is I try to do stuff too fast. Just take time and read it out loud. Once you read it out loud, you're fine. And I've actually taken to where, uh, the, and I didn't mention this in the presentation, but you can take a piece of content. Here's what I, I love about the world we're in. I can take a piece of content. Let's say I write a 500 word blog post, okay? And I think it's a pretty good one. It's going to help somebody. I can take that same blog post and I can put it on audio so I can speak it. I can put it on uh, YouTube if I wanted to. I can make a video of the same blog post. I go to LinkedIn. I can phrase it for that audience because I know it's business people, right? And, and link it to that. I can go to Facebook and make it a little more, I don't know, whatever, a little more Facebookish, whatever that is. I can tweet it. Um, there's so many things you can do with the same piece of content. So some people think, well, do you, how do you produce all that information? Well, one piece of content can last you a week, two weeks. It lasts forever. I mean, I still get hits on my experience modification blog post two and a half years later. So it, it can go. But to answer your question on editing, depends on your comfort level. Um, I had a, when, I, when I started doing stuff, I had a, I had a, lady, a lady that was a paralegal. I, sh I should take that back. She, and she, she read the blog and she said, Brent, you have some typos, you may want to work on that. So she's a person, she's, I'll help you do it. So it's up to you, it's whatever your comfort level is. Yeah? Um, with larger like insurance companies getting big money for search engine optimization, uh -huh. how do we, on a small scale, ensure the agency that you yep. stand out from somebody in the search and Good question. And I think the way that Google has, I don't want to get technical here, but the way that Google has changed their algorithms, and no one knows exactly how they do it, it used to be that you could take big companies and they could backlink it forever. They could link, 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 and you couldn't compete. Today, if you write good content and people are acknowledging it, you can pop up pretty high. Again, you're not going to compete against some of the big boys directly, and that's okay. Uh, but what I will say, another idea I would say is, is, is figure out if you've got a niche, Something you specialize in and you hammer that home. That's another thing too, is that you know, if you specialize in a certain type of coverage or a certain product or there's a certain demographic you want to reach, write about that over and 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 over. And you become the expert in that category. So again, give it time. But the way it's set up is the way I tell people is I would rather have my content, I have as much shareable as I want search searchable. Right? I want to be, I'm, I'm more worried about the quality of it than I am trying to put perfect little links in it to make sure I get pulled up in SEO. And SEO is important, that's search engine optimization. But when you start, don't worry about that so much. Just write, write from here. Ooh, where's my microphone? Any other questions? I bored you all to death. Yes? Do you outsource any of your Um, I don't, I don't. Um, now Jeffrey mentioned his video that he does. And um, I think that's fine. And the key word he said, and I, I talked to this with insurance agents, I talked to owners about this. I said, it's okay to have a third party company do your posting, your tweeting, whatever, but the key is you don't want to lose your voice. Because what I see is that small agencies that are more nimble than the big boys try to play that game and they try to act like them. And what consumers want is they want the real human element. So I, if, if you need to outsource some of that, that's okay if, if, if that's something that's going to work out, but I wouldn't lose your voice. And I can use examples because I follow Jeffrey's stuff. Again, people post that for him, but it's his content. So that's what I would tell you to do.
everybody else. Um, one resource I'll point out too, this is kind of a shameless plug. Well, I kind of. Um, I'm part of a new organization called DEMA. And uh, this is basically, this is by insurance agents, for insurance agents. Uh, I handle the blogging platform of this. I have no ownership in this program, so it's not a, I don't really you know, care whether you use it or not, other than I can tell you it's a really good resource. Because today, again, I talked about the why. This has a person that's a Facebook expert. This has a Google Plus expert. This has a YouTube expert. It has an email marketing expert. And these are real agents that have done this and made this work. And we have tutorials. We have real interaction. We do once a month webinars. So I'm part of that and I handle blogging. So if people go on a 20 minute webinar with me, I'll sit and just answer questions. What do you need to know? How can I help you? Um, and it's pretty cool. So if you go to growprogram.com slash DEMA, that'll take you there. You can also go to my, um, my website and it's, it's linked on the right side. If you go to empoweringsales.com, my personal website, um, it'll be on there as well. But, uh, but DEMA is a really good resource. and. Um, it's something that's just starting. There's a lot of um, state associations that are taking part of this because what they're finding out is that people want to do this stuff. They, they, they acknowledge why it's important, but they just have a hard time tactically of figuring out how to do it. And this will help you do that. So. Yeah? Switch platforms for your blog. Who did you have and then you switch to? Um, when I say switch platforms, it's, I, actually, I've always been on WordPress. Okay, I've always been a WordPress guy. Uh, I, well, when I first started a personal blog, I did Blogger, which is a Google product, but now I'm on WordPress. I would tell anybody if you're starting your own, starting your own use WordPress. Um, but what I did was I was a WordPress, again, not being technical, a WordPress.com versus a WordPress.org. And all that means is that when I first started my website, I was www.wordpress.com.brentmkelly. That's a hard one for people to put in the browser, right? So what I did eventually was I, I, I bought my own domain. And so that's what I did. I self-hosted. And so with self-hosting, you can do more things. And again, I don't want to get complicated because it does get a little bit complicated uh, in that aspect. Um, but I, I did Brent M. Kelly. I like to say I did Brent M. Kelly because um, I'm that important to have a middle initial. But the reality was is that Brent Kelly was taken. So. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, cool. Well, I thank you for the time. I very much appreciate it. And hopefully you got some, some value out of this today.